y'all, Dixie here. Today I want to talk to you about Fancy Maze gear. Ever since we completed our through hike of the Foothills Trail, people have been asking about changes I've made to her gear. And since I haven't talked about it for a couple of years, I thought it would be a good time to cover that. If you want to see a list of all of the items I'm going to talk about today, there will be a link to Fancy's ladder pack list in the video description. You can click there and then I'll have links to all of these different items along with what they weigh. First things first, let's cover the big three. Obviously, my shelter is also Fancy May's shelter. Well, she's kind enough to share her kennel, which is what she knows it has with me. Fancy was using the Roughwear Palisades pack. But unfortunately, somewhere along the Pinhoti Trail, it started chafing under her armpit area and I decided to just ditch it and split the contents that were in her pack between Marty and myself. The Roughwear Palisades pack worked perfectly in 2019 when we were out on the Pacific Crest Trail with my mom. I was filling in fire closure areas. So I don't know if maybe over the next year or two, fancy, filled out a little bit more and therefore it just fit a little bit too tight or maybe the east coast having more moisture caused the issues where the west coast is more arid. I'm not sure but for one reason or another this pack doesn't work for her anymore and this is why I always stress with folks to check your dog at least once a day for any rubbing or irritated areas on their entire body where their pack fits on their paws etc because just because something worked for them in the past doesn't mean that in the present and in the future it will still work ever since then i've been on the hunt for a custom fitted pack where I could send Fancy's measurements into a company and they could make a pack designed for her. I've heard a lot of good things about Groundbird gear, so I decided to give their roll top trekking pack a try. They ask for several different measurements for your dog to make sure that it will fit them well and they have a no chafe guarantee, which I really appreciate because backpacking gear in general is not necessarily the cheapest for humans and also for our pets. I ordered her new pack before we went out on the Foothills Trail and I was hoping that it would be delivered on time. Unfortunately, it wasn't, so we didn't get to test it out. We will do so on the next hike, but Groundbird Gear is a small cottage gear company. So of course, with making a custom pack to specific measurements, they're gonna have a lead time. Even though we haven't tested the pack out yet, I do like the look of it. I appreciate how the design avoids the armpit areas altogether. And the saddlebags, not only do they have the roll top design so you can kind of control the size of the pocket itself, but they have an additional strap on either side that kind of cinches down that saddlebag area so you don't have this big floppy pocket shifting side to side and causing more friction and therefore the possibility of chafing. I also dig that there's two handles on the harness slash pack so you can lift the dog if you need to to get up on a boulder or for any other purpose. I also appreciate that the harness is a separate piece from the pack so you can unclip the saddlebags and remove them. That way if I want to give her a break from carrying her stuff or I can still use that harness if we go out on a day hike and she doesn't need the space of the saddlebags. Also, it's definitely worth noting that the new pack is almost 12 ounces lighter. If you're wondering how much weight you can put in your dog's pack that is dependent upon a lot of things like breed, age, fitness level, etc. Just like with us humans, there's not a one number fits all as far as weight that we can carry. But the typical rule of thumb, if you were to do a Google search, is up to 25% of a dog's body weight can be carried by them in a pack. In my opinion, 25% is a little on the excessive side and I would never put that much weight on Fancy out on a trail or for any reason. But I'm not gonna say that there aren't dogs out there who could handle that. I tend to lean more towards the 10% or less range, especially when you're just getting out there and getting started because dogs have to work up to trail legs just like us humans do. And as far as I know, there aren't any dogs out there that have a goal in mind of how many peaks they want to bag or what through hikes they want to do. So they're really at our mercy when we take them along to 
go along with us and, and fulfill our dreams and goals. So I try to make it as comfortable as possible for Fancy when we're out there. It's not about me anymore and my hike. It becomes her and her hike. So I want her to have as much fun as possible. And if ultimately that ends up meaning that she doesn't ever carry a pack and I carry all of her weight, that's just fine with me. Now let's talk about Fancy's sleep system. She's had the same sleeping pad from the beginning, the foldable closed cell foam z -Lat pad. I like closed cell foam pads for dogs because they're basically bulletproof. You don't have to worry about them popping a hole in it and you can trim them down to fit whatever size your dog needs. But with that said, I've really been thinking about getting fancy an inflatable sleeping pad. I know that they make some for dogs that are probably more heavy duty but they're also heavier and she's a pretty chill dog once we get in the tent she kind of goes into hibernation mode until the next morning when she's finally ready to hack again the reason i'm thinking about getting her an inflatable sleeping pad is anytime i get up out of the tent and she's in there alone when i come back she's on my inflatable sleeping pad i think she really prefers it. I know that I prefer it. And a sleeping pad like mine, the Neo Air X Lite only weighs eight ounces. So I don't know. If any of y'all have any experience using that type of sleeping pad for your dog, let me know how it's worked out for you. I know they have the patch kits that I could bring out with me in the field and I could bring a couple extra just in case, but she's never popped mine. She's in there with me, so I might give it a go. The first time I took Fancy backpacking, the only thing that I took for her in the way of a sleeping bag was just a fleece blanket from Walmart. It was pretty cheap, relatively lightweight, and she froze because what I didn't anticipate was how cold it was going to get in Washington in the summertime. So mom and I just put our puffy coats on her and our raincoats when we slept at night and she was fine with that added insulation. So all of this gear is definitely going to depend on where you're going, what time of year, etc. When we went out on the Pinhoti Trail this past winter, I knew she was going to need more than just that fleece blanket. So I decided to use my 20 degree Yeti under quilt. It's just meant for my hammock, but coincidentally, it works perfectly as a quilt for a medium sized dog. The only issue I can see with using an under quilt like that for your dog is if you have a dog that gets up and spins around a hundred times in the middle of the night, you're gonna find yourself waking up, finding the dog shivering because they've laid on top of the quilt, compressed it down and now they're cold. So you gotta dig it out from under them, cover them back up. But I found that Ground Bird Gear makes a turtle top quilt. It's basically just a top quilt with a harness stitched in and it's a nice soft material and you just clip it together. And that way, when they get up in the middle of the night and turn around, they still have that quilt draped over them. When they lay down, it's still on top of them. It can also double as a puffy coat, which I thought was pretty cool. You can roll up the collar area and the back end area so they don't pee pee on it. They have two different options for temperature rating in the turtle top quilt. So you can get warmer than freezing temperatures and colder than freezing temperatures. Since I knew out on the Foothills Trail, I was gonna have her in temperatures at the lowest, the upper 30s. I felt like I would go with the warmer than freezing temperature. Unfortunately, I think Fancy May is a cold sleeper like her mom, and when the quilt came in, it wasn't as lofty as I thought it would be, so I took the 20 degree Yeti under quilt that she's used in the past just in case, and I'm really glad that I did because with the turtle top quilt alone, she was still shivering on those upper 30 degree nights. So she ended up using both of them and being extra toasty and going forward, if we were hiking in colder temperatures again, I would probably take both of those because again, I want her to be as comfortable as possible and get a good night's sleep just like I want to. Even though the Ground Bird Gear Turtle Top Quilt can act like a puffy coat, I prefer to not have fancy hike in that when it's cold outside just because one, it's so expensive and if it were to snag on some brush, then poof, it's gone. Two, if down gets wet, it kind of melts and loses its insulating factor. So I decided to get her a synthetic jacket for actually hacking in 
when it's cold out that way if she brushes up on something that's got dew on it she still is insulated and warm while hiking i went with the quincy insulated water resistant jacket by Roughwear. it's not waterproof but i have had it when we're in light misting rain or even snow and it was damp on the outside but she was still warm and toasty on the inside for a raincoat I guess I'm a bad mom because I still haven't gotten her a proper doggy raincoat. I've got my eye out for something that's Dyneema Cuban fiber just because that way it's going to be a waterproof material that doesn't soak up and hold that water and it'll be lightweight. So if y'all have any suggestions on something like that, please let me know in the comments. But in the meantime, I've just used those temporary 99 cent emergency ponchos and tied it up around her waist and it seems to have done the trick as far as holding in some body heat and also keeping some parts of her dry. It's really hard to keep a dog any kind of dry when it rains because they're so close to the ground that they're kicking up that water anyway, but it definitely does help to have something on them. But usually I have to pack out a few of those emergency rain ponchos because one day hiking in the rain and she pretty much has one of those shredded. One thing that Fancy Mae doesn't really use that often, but I always make sure I have it is boots and socks. There are a lot of different brands of booties and I'm not sure that one is so much better than the others, but we use the Roughwear Grip Trex boots and the Boot and Bark sock liners. Dogs do sweat through their paws, so it's a good idea to let them be aired out as much as possible. I know a lot of folks probably think, well, great, if my dog might have issues with their paws on trail, then I'll just put these boots on and it protects their feet and we're good to go. But the boots themselves where they Velcro around the leg or any other points where they touch the foot can cause rubbing issues. And also having the boots on because they do sweat through their paws can cause them to potentially overheat. So really the only time I use the boots is when the ground is extremely hot or if we're in a situation where we're just going over some pretty gnarly rock just very consistently and I think that her pads might be getting sore or I wanna protect them for a little while. But you also wanna keep in mind that if you're on an area where you've got a lot of snow, for example, and it's kind of steep or even um, a cliffy type area, anywhere where you want your dog to be able to have maximum dexterity, you might want to leave the boots off because those definitely restrict movement and allow them not to grip as well. It's definitely better to start off doing a low amount of miles and allow them to build up the toughness of their paws than to just try to slap boots on and say, well, this will take care of it. The rough wear boots are a little on the expensive side. So there is a website that somebody told me about. I have not tried this company myself, but you can go to dogbooties.com and they've got some 1000 denier Cordura booties that Velcro on. These are $3 a piece. I definitely don't think that they're going to be as durable as the rough wear boots, but again, if you're not using them that much and they also look like they might be more lightweight, so that's a perk too. But whatever you do, I would definitely have a pair of booties just in case. I'm still using the same leash as before, the Roughwear Roamer Bungee Leash. I like that it gives so it's not so rigid. I also appreciate that you can adjust the wrist strap to where it goes around your waist. I like to put mine on my hip belt strap. You could carry it on your wrist if you wanted to, but I like that there are options. Also, if you want to bring the dog in, and have them close to you, there is a handle area up near where it attaches to your dog's harness. And I like the clamp style hook that attaches to the dog's harness or collar because you kind of mash down on it instead of having to slide down on a little hook. Fancy's new food bowl is much lighter than the one that she had before, and I think it's gonna last longer too. The roughwear bowl that we had before, the liner finally almost kind of dry rotted and started peeling out of the bottom of the bowl. But now we've got a Dyneema bowl from Groundbird Gear, which weighs less than a half an ounce. And it's five and a half inches by five and a half inches by two and a half inches, which is 
perfect for the amount of food she needs. For a water bowl, we are still using a KFC container that their sides come in. Just the bottom clear part that you'd get your green beans or mashed potatoes in. She doesn't need to just chug a bunch of water while she's hiking anyway, so it kind of limits the amount of water that she's able to drink at one time. Also, it's really lightweight. Uh, it's not expensive, so I wouldn't be upset if we were to lose it. And it fits in my hip belt pocket for easy access while we're hiking. First aid is definitely important to carry for a dog. For myself, I kind of lack on that sometimes more than I should. But when I have her, I want to make sure that I've got certain things she might need, like Pepto-Bismol if they're throwing up or they have diarrhea, that's something good to have on hand. And also Benadryl if they were to have an allergic reaction. And make sure you know the dosing that you would need for the weight of your dog before you go, even if you have to write it down in the notes in your phone or in your journal. That way you're not sitting out there going, oh my gosh, I don't know how much is enough or too much and I can't Google it because I don't have cell phone reception. I always carry gauze and medical tape. That way if she ends up with some kind of cut on her foot, I can put some gauze and wrap it up with tape. Some people really like to carry musher's wax. This is good conditioning for their feet and kind of helps protect it and keep the paws supple. I found that it didn't seem to make a huge difference for Fancy, so I didn't carry it the last time we went hiking, but you may find that it's great for your dog. And I have recently purchased the Pack and Paw Rescue Harness, just in case we end up in a situation where she's been bitten by a snake or breaks her leg, I can easily put her in the harness and tote her out. Another item I take just as a precaution is a muzzle. And this is mainly because Fancy doesn't like other dogs. She is aggressive and reactive. And I think a lot of that is trauma from the past. I found her when she was a puppy. She was nearly starved to death. She attached pretty quickly to Hank, who was my dog that actually found her. But since then, she just really hasn't allowed any other dogs in her pack. And I think it's resource guarding. I think she's scared to death to end up like she was before. So to prevent that, she just doesn't want any dogs in her bubble. Her stuff is her stuff. So usually this isn't an issue. I also only take Fancy out on trail when I have another person backpacking with me, whether that's Marty, my mom, etc. But that way the other person leaves, I'm in the back and Fancy stays between us. So that way the person in front can see if another dog is approaching and can let the other person know, hey, our dog doesn't love other dogs. And we've seen a lot of other people on trail who their dogs are the same way. So somebody will step off trail, allow the other person to pass. And usually as long as the dog doesn't come up to fancy, she's fine. It's not like she's trying to, you know, go after that dog and get off the leash and beat him up or anything like that. She just doesn't want the other dog around her. But just in case I ended up in a crazy situation where there were several dogs off leash and it's hard to kind of keep her away from them, then for their protection, I can put the muzzle on her. We've only had one situation where something like this occurred. And honestly, I never even thought about this being a possibility. So just as a warning to other dog owners, uh, whether your dog likes other dogs or not, we were up on the Penhody Trail in a county where they allow hunting dogs to run deer and three different dogs came up to us and thankfully they were really friendly and they just wanted pets and to meet Fancy, but she didn't want to meet them. So having that extra person to kind of shoo them off where I could take her over to the side really helped, but I thought that I was gonna end up having to put the muzzle on because we'd get one dog run off and another would come up from behind and it just kind of ended up being a tricky situation. So if you also have a dog who is reactive, uh, it might be a good idea to only go with another person and to also take a muzzle. But I have heard of hunt dogs approaching a dog on the Foothills Trail this year and they were not friendly dogs and they were dog aggressive ended up ganging up on these two people who had their two dogs with them. One of the dogs ended up loose and running off and it was injured. They, they did end up finding their dog, but not to scare you, just to let you know that sometimes you will find dogs who are not accompanied by a human on trail and you should be 
prepared for or at least think about what to do in those situations. Finally, the last item that I always have with me when I'm hiking with Fancy May out on trail is an umbrella. I learned when we were in the desert section in 2019 how important this is. First of all, I would never take another dog to the desert area, but having instant shade when you need it is very important. And you might find this same situation in the winter time. It's a warmer day in the winter. There are no leaves on the trees. The sun is beaten down. It's warmer than you expected. So just knowing that I can create shade for her whenever she might need it is priceless to me. And also it's really nice to have when it rains or you want shade for yourself. So I pretty much always go backpacking with an umbrella anyway. So anyway, that is Fancy May's current gear list. I'm sure that it will change again going forward because gear is an ever changing thing, apparently even for dogs. If you're new to backpacking with dogs in this video, I pretty much just stuck to her gear, but if you want other things that I've learned or that I consider when I'm taking Fancy out, you can check out another video that I made. It's called Everything I've Learned Backpacking with Dogs. Hopefully that's what it's called. I'll put another link or two in the video description of this video where you can check that out for kind of a more full picture of what backpacking with a dog is like. But just as a cliff notes, I cannot stress enough how important it is that if you go backpacking with your dog, you tend to their needs before your own. And it doesn't matter if you wanted to do 50 miles on this trek, if they're not able to do that, then you have to realize that and know that your hack basically becomes your dog's hack. If y'all have any questions about the gear items that I listed in today's video, or if you have any gear suggestions for what has worked well with your dogs, please feel free to leave that in the comments below. Thank y'all so much for watching. Don't forget to subscribe before you go, and we will see y'all next time.